We're in Misano Adriatico, etc. Et Today is the 13th of 18th. rubbish. It's a, <laughs> it was it was the 11th, 9/11, two days ago. It's the 13th of September, 2000, oh, I thought, I thought, 2006. I thought you meant which session, etc. No, oh, that's. <laughs> yes, right. Um, we're with Professor Harish Trivedi, who is Professor of English at the University of Delhi. Welcome. Um, you've been professor here uh, for a session in translation studies, and I'm interested first in, in the work you've done on translation or in translation studies. P please remind us of that. I think uh, the first thing to say here would be I'm uh, quite shocked myself that I'm a professor here in translation studies because I don't know what I've done to deserve this honor. I haven't published very much in translation, but I hope to. The few things that I have published, perhaps the one that is known a bit, is a book that I co-edited with Susan Bassnett called Postcolonial Translation. Uh, apart from that, uh, I published a few essays here and there, some of which have come out recently, in fact, and uh, I'm working on a book which I hope will come out again sooner than later, uh, called, tentatively called, uh, Translation in India, India in Translation. Mm -hmm. My main concerns in whatever I've published or hope to publish shortly uh, have been, firstly, the kind of questions that interest everybody in translation studies, uh, theoretical questions. And so far as case studies are concerned or actual discussion of translations is concerned, uh, my field is India. And uh, I, I have uh, addressed two kinds of things there. One is the history of translation in India with our many languages, uh, with our long, unbroken, continuous literary tradition of about 3,500 years. And I've come to some quite paradoxical conclusions about that, uh, that there was no translation in India, but bilingualism and multilingualism mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. uh, for the first 3,300 years of these 3,500 years. Mm -hmm. And the translation as a concept and as, a, as the kind of practice that's recognized as such in the West came to us with the intervention of the West, which is a euphemism, of course, for British conquest and rule. This locates you as a post-colonial. Are you happy with that? that, that that's what we would see was bringing to translation studies. Are you happy with that characterization? Yes, indeed, indeed. You know, when Susan and I were talking about doing a book together, um, the idea the I <laughs> is, is funny, but the way it came to us was Susan said, let's do a book together, and only then did we think of what to do it on. Mm -hmm. And uh, her contribution in that title was translation, and my contribution was post-colonial. I am actually, I do identify with that, that most of what I do is post-colonial with the very big reservation and qualification that post-colonial discourse as constituted in the West and as it is conducted now in classrooms and publications and so on is uh, determined, over-determined by the Western Academy and its needs, especially the American Academy. Mm -hmm. And while I do identify with the label post-colonial, uh, I see myself as fighting against the kind of formulation uh, and uh, disciplining of post-colonial discourse that has been going on in the West. I've picked quarrels with Homi Bhabha and Gatris Pivak and Edward Said. And it seems to me that for those of us who are not part of the Western Academy, there is a great need to raise our voice and say that though the post-colonial claims to speak for us, it does not really, and it speaks only in ways that might be acceptable and manageable within the Western Academy. So my interest in translation, yes, surely it comes out of that. And I would say that in my work in several areas, comparative literature, Indian literature, uh, even modernism, uh, all my work actually uh, can be gathered together under the umbrella of the post-colonial in this resistant, combative sense. Would you locate yourself in cultural studies, if not translation studies? I mean, there's a wider frame operating here. How does that term cultural studies sit with you? 
I, I distrust that sub-discipline. Uh, I do not like much of what's going on there, though of course I see the impulse, the good impulse with which it began. Uh, translation after the cultural turn uh, is of course uh, a broadly cultural activity. It's not a linguistic activity as Catford and others used to say. Mm. Now we study through translation uh, or in translation we study not so much language as the culture uh, of which it is the vehicle. Uh, yeah. And uh, it seems to me that there is of course a lot to be gained by, by uh, looking at translation as a transaction between different cultures rather than different languages. So to that extent I am with it. But in cultural studies, uh, people have gone into areas of investigation and people have adopted some ideological stances, which I think do not do translation much good at all. I believe in translation. I believe that there may be a conflict of interest between doing translation studies and cultural studies. In fact, one of the, one of the lectures I gave here is called Translating Culture versus Cultural Translation. If cultural translation is what we get out of cultural studies, then I want no part of it. Because in the post-colonial, post-modern sense, cultural studies uh, is taken to mean uh, anthropological representation of a particular community or people, mm -hmm. or uh, even more influentially, through Homi Bhabha, it's uh, taken to mean just migrancy. Yes. The, uh, the, the movement of a small segment of people from some countries to the first world and the problems of managing them by the first world and the problems of these migrants as well. Now how, that how is not translation. Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. an interesting point. At the moment in the American Academy the term translation and translation studies is covering all forms of cultural hybridity and movement of people as well as what we know as translation. What do we do? Do we go with that or do we stay with translations as interlingually produced texts? Uh, well, I mean, to, to make a diplomatic answer, one could say that there are merits in both these points of view, mm -hmm. but I know very clearly which side I am on. I, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of using the word translation in a loose or broad sense, because it seems to me that unless we insist on interlingual trans transactions as mm -hmm. translation, the core meaning of translation, what we are in danger of doing is, or letting happen, is that ultimately they may be just one global language with no other languages to translate into or translate from. So it's, I think, very much in the interest of the preservation of languages which are not English that they should insist that there should be at least two languages in the world, if not 2,000. Actually, this leads into the next, the next question. Uh, from the perspective of European translation studies, what do you think we can learn from the Indian case, the Indian tradition, or from your own work? I'm not used to, that, to this kind of question. What can Europe learn from elsewhere? What can the West learn from the East? No, I don't think, I don't think this question is asked often enough. And I think it's very generous of you to ask that. There is recently a movement towards uh, bringing into translation studies and the concept of translation and the practice of translation from other non-Western cultures. And I, ha again, have mixed feelings about that. It's a very good thing. It's a kind of a post-colonial thing, really, to try and diversify and broaden the discourse, translation discourse. At the same time, as again I've said uh, in a paper about what the concept of translation is in India, or different concepts of translation in the plural, uh, can we really bring in other discourses into a discourse which is already quite dominant, dominant enough throughout the world without co-opting them and without using them in the service of uh, the Western discursive practices regarding translation? If I say translation in India is called Anuvad and that, has, that is a different metaphor, that has a different tradition how to do it, uh, which do not uh, line up with anything in the West at all, what am I doing? Is it, is it native informancy? Is it exoticizing what I have? And how will the West then uh, incorporate it or deal with it? 
on its own terms. So one has these conflicting impulses. At the same time, on the whole, I think it's certainly a better thing that people in the West should know about uh, uh, what's been going on in India in terms of translation or related activities than not. Uh, Maria Timoshko and uh, I have um, both been uh, talking about it, including in print in a volume just edited by Theo Hermans, uh, translating others. Mm -hmm. uh, my feeling is, yes, what can, the, what can Europe or the West learn from the Indian case? I think the first thing to learn perhaps would be that we have 22 major languages, so it's a bit like Europe and uh, the kind of coexistence between them. Europe as a, as a unified concept has come into existence only recently. Before that it was the history of repeated conflict and appropriation and conquest and reconquest. It's not that in India we were always peaceful. This went on as well. But uh, I think political and military battles were one kind of thing. And happy linguistic coexistence was another thing in India. And this was made possible in a stronger way in India, I think, uh, because of the common origin of languages from Sanskrit than perhaps uh, the comparable case in Europe and Latin and so on. So translation in a multilingual context, which necessarily does not promote more translation, is one kind of thing that India has to offer by way mm -hmm. of uh, study. Another is, uh, it seems to me, that in India uh, there is a tremendous tendency these days for Indians themselves to translate our literature into English. This kind of self-translation or auto-translation on this huge scale again may not be uh, a very common practice in other countries of the world. And uh, then the question arises of what we translate into and who we translate for. For other Indians only, in Indian English, what is palpably, uh, what palpably looks like, smells like, feels like Indian English? Or uh, should we really aim at uh, going international and uh, uh, knowingly uh, alter our translations in the hope that it will, our literature will burst in a big way upon the global scene? That's again a very complex question. There are more Indians translating into English than there may be Britishers or Americans. Let me change tack. Um, when you were 22, 23, 24, I want to know how you got to where you are here. What were you doing then? And, and where did those paths lead to? Just, just very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not ready to write my autobiography yet. I think there's more to come. <laughs> but let me go back. Let me go back. To, let me go back to this moment. Uh, at at 20, I had got my MA, and I was I had begun to teach in a university in in, where, in, in India, India in yes. India. At 24, I had got a scholarship to go to England. In fact, that's the year I did go to uh, I did go there to start my PhD which was on Virginia Woolf. Uh, we all begin how we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got back with that PhD, I said to myself, let that be a closed chapter of my life. Let me now go on to do something else. Because what Britain did for me was to uh, prove to me, and I needed proof, that English literature was not my literature. It could never be my literature in the way that uh, it was the literature of people who lived there earlier. And this is, this is the extent of colonization that happens. I was not the only one. We all thought that English literature was as much ours as anybody else's. And living in Britain for three or four years did that wonderful service to me. Mm -hmm. When I got back, I began some comparative studies. For example, I wrote a paper. The first paper I wrote after getting back to India was on an adaptation of a novel by George Eliot, Silas Marner, mm -hmm. a thoroughgoing adaptation, totally, uh, total cultural translation as some people call it, <laughs> uh, by, the, by the best novelist who has ever written in Hindi. So there is, he's no less, he was no less gifted in Hindi, he's no less big than George Eliot in English. So this kind of interaction was what I got into. I wrote a book called 
colonial transactions, English literature in India. Mm -hmm. I began teaching comparative literature with translation as a part of it. Then I began teaching a graduate course in translation studies. I began, uh, I began teaching British writing on India and Indian writing not only in English but specifically on Britain. So I got interested in what was going on over the last uh, two or three centuries of colonization. And because I have a bit of Sanskrit, and uh, apart from one or two modern languages, modern Indian languages, I pushed it further back uh, gradually to go to the, the literary tradition of India and how it has developed differently uh, from what I perceive to be the development of the Western literary tradition. So all these, all these questions came together and it's not that I do not now, that I'm not now interested in canonical Western literature. I still teach Shakespeare and Pope and Byron and so on as part of my job to keep my hand in. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think it's a good thing. You know, we have this tremendous advantage of having both. And a number of people in the West may have many languages, but they're mostly all European languages. And this historical advantage that has come to us uh, as a kind of incidental effect to colonization is something that I think many more of us need to build on. So just, just finally, are there areas where you think more research or thought is needed within translation studies or about translation? Yes, I do think so. You know, one of the questions, for example, that has interested me greatly is uh, most people who review works of translation or who discuss them at any length are bilinguals who know both languages and therefore are thought to be competent to do this. I think that's wrong from the start because translations are meant for somebody who does not know the original language. Uh, if I know both the languages, why should I bother with the translation? The theoretical question here is how, how, does, how can a monolingual reader judge the quality of translation? I wrote a paper on it some years ago there are only one or two other attempts that I know of addressing this question, and it seems to me a vital concern that this should be addressed. Uh, I'm still working on it, though I presented that paper at a conference, I've never published it, because I think we need to work more on it, I need to work more on it, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that is not realized, even though translation studies have become bigger and bigger over the last couple of decades, compared with what they were before, which was virtually non-existent. I think there is a need to spread consciousness and to raise sensitivity uh, about how much comes to us in translation and how to, uh, how to recognize this, how to, uh, how to distinguish between works in the original and works in translation. Uh, as something that is a distinction that we cannot live without. Um, still, I read, I read discussions of translation in which very well-meaning people say it doesn't even read like a translation. I don't think that's the way to go. So I think generally we need to be more aware of what is translation and what is not. And how, you know, we talk about globalization. The globe would not exist without translation. Even unified cultures would not exist without internal translation. Uh, the effect of translation, the power of translation, I think this needs to be brought out even more clearly rather than what seem to me smaller questions of dynamic equivalence or non-dynamic equivalence mm -hmm. or yeah. dynamic non-equivalence. These are far too technical matters compared with the bigger job yeah. that we have in hand. Good. Thank you, Professor Driedi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Because of